So, good afternoon. Welcome to my talk. My name is Jill Maraca. I'm the Associate Director of Web Development Services here at Princeton University. Um, I have a team of 16 folks, and we consist of project managers, designers, developers, content strategists, and our primary responsibility at the university is creating websites for academic and administrative departments. So we build sites for, for places such as the Department of History, the Department of English, uh, Office of the Provost, Office of the President, and so forth. And that's our main job here at the university. So um, like all technology products, there comes a time when you need to shut one of those down. Uh, we have an old content management system. It goes by the name of Roxin. I would be shocked if anyone in this room ever heard of it. And therefore, we are shutting it down. We, um, you know, so our, that, that's our challenge. And, and you know, how do you make over 200 people move off of their website? Something they, they might have had for five, six, seven years. Yeah, <laughs> this is how people think about change sometimes. I have to change, you know, I just learned how to do something. I don't want to move my, move my website, I'm so familiar with this. Um, we have a wide range of, of clients that we work with. Some folks are technical, some not so much, and we needed to um, reach out to these people to move their websites. So I'll, I'll give you a little bit of, of background about this project. Um, in the spring of 2015, we did a high-level assessment of these 365 websites that were running on this Roxen system. Um, the high-level assessment consisted of putting the sites into to, uh, buckets. Is this a small site? Is this a medium site? Is this a large site? And we based that on a set of criteria. Um, this is a manual assessment. We, we spread the assessment across, across the team. You know, someone took 10 sites, someone else took 10 sites, and we just sort of ranked them and assigned a point value to them. And that's how we came up with um, a way to put our arms around the size of this assessment. We've got this many small, we've got this many medium, we've got this many large. It was then in the summer of 2015 that we communicated, we are shutting down Roxon. And, and that's where you know, this, face, this face comes in, because some folks did have that reaction. Um, the communication came from the university CIO, so we went to the highest, most um, IT leader here at the university, so the message was serious, we really have to shut this down, we can no longer keep running this system. We then began migrating sites off of the system in the fall of 2015, and we aimed to shut this down in September of 2019. We're giving people ample time to move off of Roxon. So why move? Um, you know, IT, IT has its own motivation. So I, from an IT perspective, we knew that the current CMS was no longer keeping up with our needs. There were, there were um, functionality requests that our clients were coming to us for, and we said, we cannot achieve this in the current system. And the current system had no roadmap for actually building in new features. Uh, we also um, analyzed the company behind the Roxon product, and we did not feel that like they were keeping up with modern website needs as well. So that was a big driver of us shutting it down. Um, I mentioned it's difficult to enhance, difficult to add functionality, and we also, as part of this shutdown project, wanted to get out of running a local infrastructure. We were, we were interested in moving our, our website CMS to the cloud. You know, we didn't just want to move one thing as it is to another thing as it is. And that's where this idea of improving while we're moving comes into play. It's not often or on a frequent basis that we shut down an entire service at the university. So we wanted to take this opportunity to improve things while we moved. Um, but you don't, you're not going exactly from the same house to another house. Um, you might need to downsize your website. You might need to upsize your website. It's not a one-to-one -one move. And we're also not having people box up everything they have in their house and move everything that they have into the new house. We need to encourage folks to get rid of some junk. Uh, so I, I like to use this analogy of you're cleaning out your closet. 
you know, you've got some things that they're kind of old. There's some old food. Some stuff's falling down in the back. So when you're taking it out of the closet and putting it into the new closet, you need to throw out the junk. And you also need to think about how it's organized in that closet. So, you know, on the, on the, the messy side of things, let's say the pasta is all over the place. When you're moving into your new house or your new closet, let's group the pastas together, let's group the cereals together, and let's clean it up. So I use these two analogies when I'm talking to folks about moving their websites. And you know, everyone's got that junk drawer, you know, there's stuff shoved in there. I also use that analogy because people can identify with it. You know, I think of uh, website files. It's not like something you bump into every day or you look at every day. There can be a lot of junk tucked away in a directory and you have no idea it's there. So you don't see it, you don't bump into it, but it needs to be cleaned up. Um, there's other motivations around um, improving while you're moving. Sites needed a design refresh. They weren't responsive. Um, they weren't mobile friendly. They needed that better content organization. We knew there was outdated content live on the web that shouldn't be there. And we knew that some of that content was not accessible. Um, so these are some fictitious quotes. So uh, if, if a department website had a, out, an outdated design, it can convey that that department has outdated knowledge. You know, this department specializes in technology, maybe technology from two decades ago. So when there's prospective students looking to major in a department, they can judge the department based on the look of the website. And I think, you know, in the real world, people do judge a book by its covers. So maybe the content on the website was current, but the way it was presented, it made it look outdated. Uh, I wish I could read the department's news on my tablet or smartphone, etc. Um, our current CMS did not have responsive designs or themes, and so we knew that that was definitely an improvement we wanted to make. I can't find what I'm looking for. This website is a mess. There's a number of messy websites out there. Um, pages, menus, they grew over time. Uh, the website's owner, you know, whoever was responsible for it in the department had changed over time, so someone did something one way and someone organized it a, a different way, and things grew kind of messy. Um, this is actually a real quote. That person hasn't worked here in two years. While I was reviewing a website with someone, they had not looked at their About Us page in, I guess, two years, and there was still a staff member listed who no longer worked in the department. So. There is definitely outdated content out there on Princeton University's websites. Also, the you know, click on what green link? I don't know how that's, uh, I'm not colorblind, but there's actually a green uh, 74 among all these dots. Um, we knew that we had content that didn't meet accessibility requirements. So we began moving these websites and we learned some lessons. So, around uh, communication. In an ideal world, you know, change is embraced with enthusiasm. People come running to us. They also line up in an orderly fashion, and we had all the time in the world. Now, we did have a four-year uh, span of the project, but we also you know, needed to get certain things done in a timely manner, because we knew we had some pretty large websites to fit into that time frame. But what really happened is that some some website owners, they did jump on the opportunity. They came to us quickly, they were eager to move, and that was great. Some folks dragged their feet. Some were worried that Drupal was hard to learn. Um, and some even forgot they had a website. <laughs> um, and then we had a mix of, of all sorts of, of, of website owners. I think one thing to point out at Princeton University is that the um, content owners of these websites, it's not necessarily their primary job to own the website. It might be one of, of several hats that they wear, and the website hat is not the biggest hat. So when they heard that they had to then pay more attention to the website, actually do something larger with it, some folks did uh, worry. So things you know around the communication considerations, when you have to tell 200 plus people they need to move their site, you definitely have to take the time to explain why. And so I do spend a lot of my time meeting with individual website owners and just explaining, here's why we have to do this. Um, I also 
simplify the migration steps. So say first we're going to look at this, and then do this, and this. I just want to reduce their anxiety about moving. Um, I also offered uh, options for the do-it-yourselfers. There were people who were very eager to get going. We couldn't start with all the eager folks. So I did give them steps and an option for them to do it themselves. I said, here's where you can build your new site. Here's the steps you can take. Go, we're here for some help. Training and documentation are, are big as well. Offering folks written documentation that they could read, as well as providing a training class for them to go to and learn um, is helpful. It, it eases their anxiety. They feel like they have a resource to go to, and we're here for them while they move their sites. Um, they're not stuck. They're not on their own. And the university did not want to do that to people as well. So like I said, we, it's not often we completely shut something down, and we wanted to make sure that we supported all these website owners in the transition off the old CMS. Um, Offering an incentive is great, too. We were able to offer an incentive. So uh, my department is within the university, but we are cost recovery. So I do charge departments for the work that I do. We're like a mini agency within Princeton. We just work with Princeton folks. So one of the incenti incentives for moving was this discount of work. You know, we're going to move your site, and you're not going to have to pay for all of it, or none of it. We were able to fit a number of migrations into the free, I call them coupons, and there was no cost to the, to the departments other than their time. So an incentive was great, and our CIO and the university was behind that, and they did offer a pool of money that I could then distribute to the departments for their use. So back to the communication, it's always great to go to folks and say, I have money to give you. The people are very happy to hear that. Um, estimating and planning. In an ideal world, every website is consistent. Nobody hacked the code. <laughs> website owners knew exactly what they wanted from their sites, and they even remembered that they had a website. <laughs> but what, what really happened was we found some creative coding, some things that we were not sure why they were done. Um, we found some legacy modules. so. Uh, we had an older news module in our Roxon system that for whatever time at the beginning of Roxon was there, some folks were still using that, and over the years we had implemented a new one. So we still had to deal with this legacy module. Um, renewed interest in the website. So this is both a good and a bad thing. Um, renewed interest was good in that people were like, yes, my website, I've got lots of ideas, let's do this now. But it's a bad thing because we still had to get the migration done. We still had to move them off. That was the priority number one. And so these new requests for work um, could delay that. Um, we found lots of neglected websites. Um, and some of them had no owner. So during the estimating and planning of our migration project, we had to map the creative coding to standard Drupal functionality. We had to look at, you know, why did they do this? Why was this this way? Does it have to be this way? Can we standardize it? We built in contingency time for the unexpected as much as we could. So if you remember, I, I said we had, I had funding to, to hand out to each department. Um, we still had to, bit, to do the work within the funding if the department didn't have money to supplement the project. Um, but I think this contingency time, um, it applies to many projects. You know, there's things that come up and you don't expect them. Um, we also had options for migrating, but not too many options. So remember the folks that, the, with the renewed interest in their website? We needed to um, keep them in line and not let a project get too out of control. So we gave them specific options. You can either shut down your site, you can archive your site at archive.org. You can move it into a, a templated solution, or we can build you a custom solution. Also with um, unexpected things. So at, at Princeton, we do, um, my team does keep a database of all the websites that are under our wings and who their owners are. But the website owner, if they leave the university or leave their department, it's their responsibility to tell us, and oftentimes that doesn't happen. So it's 
often that we have an old name and we have to then go track down who is the new owner. So that takes an, an administrative time on our part to do that. Okay, so getting down to business, the actual migrating. In an ideal world, we had one magical script that just moved everything over. And all the content that was supposed to be structured was structured. So news, events, people directories. Um, a lot of that we found was just text on pages, unstructured HTML text on pages. And in this ideal world, best practices were followed and no content was neglected. What really happened was our migration script is constantly tweaked. So you know all those hacks and surprises and nuances on each rocks and website? We constantly have to tweak that script every time we run it on a website. And the script doesn't do everything. There's lots of manual cleanup. Um, so we'll move pages over and uh, content that should be in a heading tag is just made bold. That's probably the most common thing we see over and over again. And the script isn't smart enough to say, oh, wait, this bold is supposed to be a heading. Um, unstructured content was manu manually made structured. So we, we do want people, when they move into our Drupal system, to take advantage of the content types. Uh, we have specific content types for events, news, people, courses, blogs. I'm probably forgetting a few. Um, we, we, we want people to take advantage of that. We want people to use the taxonomy system. And so we encourage them to take their unstructured content and make it structured. But that doesn't happen automatically. Also, change requests, they occur throughout the projects. I think this is, you know, this happens with any project. There's change requests. We had to keep those in line to fit the budget and fit the time frame. Because you know, four years does sound like a lot of time, but when you have hundreds of sites to move, you need to keep the process moving because you don't want to get to the end and be stuck with so many websites that you're really just trying to fly through them. We also found unexpected content, things that people just didn't know were on their site that were still live on the website. So there's a lot of, a lot of considerations when it came to migrating. Um, the website owner needed to be prepared to read through the content so you know, some of these sites, they hadn't read through in I don't know how long. I mean, from that example where someone who hadn't worked there in two years was still listed as working there, you could see this was an eye-opener that they really had to, to read through their websites. Um, we found that the editors, they're very familiar with Microsoft Word, so that familiarity was something we could build upon. We could say, look, when you're moving into Drupal and you're editing your pages, there's this ribbon, and it's very like Microsoft Word. You click on the bold, and things become bold. And so the more that we could make the Drupal editor, the what you see is what you get editor, like uh, Microsoft Word, th they felt comfortable with that. And also remember that the, the folks who were editing these websites, some of them had no technical skills. They worked in Microsoft Word, maybe, but they needed a place to build and edit a site that was for non-technical folks. Um, Automated content inventories. So we use some tools to run an automated content inventory on sites, and this would help us find those hidden pages. And some of these pages and directories weren't even in the menu structure, and folks just simply forgot that they had them, or maybe at one point they unlinked to it but didn't realize the content was still alive on the web. People could, a web crawler could still find it. People could still get to those pages. So the automated content inventory helped with that. Um, you have to build in time for um, cl content cleanup, so especially around the headings. Um, we don't want people using bold for headings. They have to use the heading tag. And the only way that we found that we could do that is you, you have to go and read every page, highlight the heading, and select the heading. Um, budgeting and scheduling. So like I said, we, you know, four years sounds like a lot of time, but when you have that many websites and that many different owners to get through, it actually becomes a short amount of time. So I, I do a lot of um, I do a lot of presentations around campus. I try to reach as many people as I can. I do have to repeat myself over and over and over again because I need to reach the people that I haven't reached yet. And there's dozens of people that maybe I haven't reached yet, or they heard my presentation in 2016 and now it's 2018. So I have to go and do a lot of 
outreach about this project. And I do, I will meet with anybody who wants me to meet with them and I'll proactively schedule these meetings to tell them, look, you know, time is running out, we need to move your website off. Um, Google Analytics has been a great tool for us. It helps us build the case, you know, look, you've got all of this content, you're saying you want us to move it, but no one has looked at it in so many years. And so we will use the analytics to show them, you think this is important, it's really not important, we're gonna just let it go. It's just gonna, not, it's not coming over. If we do have to move it over, we then explain, well, you've gotta clean it up, and they sort of second, you know, second guess themselves. They don't wanna move it over. So I do recommend Google Analytics as a, as a tool just to prove you don't have to move all that content over. Also, you'll find um, when moving to Drupal that there's some locally stored content that's much better stored elsewhere, and videos is the prime example. We had a number of folks, they just uploaded their video right into a Roxon uh, directory, and those, those types of media files are better served from a YouTube player or uh, the university has something called Media Central. And this, you know, this allows you to play the video right in the page. So if we, if we encountered websites that had a lot of these types of files, that did increase the, the scope of the project. They had to be moved off. But then again, if Google Analytics showed nobody was looking at these files, we could just try to convince the department to just let them go. Okay. So design and accessibility. In an ideal world, every website had a timeless design. <laughs> we also predicted the future. We had already made our websites WCAG 2.0 A compliant. And website owners remember to pick heading tags and enter their alternative text. Of course, none of this happened. We found, we made some ugly websites in the past. And accessibility what? I think we, we kind of knew about accessibility. We tried our best, but we really weren't that educated around it. Um, and there were some websites that didn't leverage the Princeton brand. So there, we found some websites that even though they had a princeton.edu, URL, they didn't have the logo. And we feel that every website that comes out of Princeton should at least have the logo and link back to the main university website. Um, so some considerations around that. We, um, we definitely made all of our new Drupal themes responsive. So we didn't even tell, uh, we didn't have to wait for our departments to come tell us they wanted responsive designs. We said proactively, you're just getting them as part of this project. So that was just built into the project from the start. Um, we did not re recreate any ugly designs. We tried not to. We did have some folks who just didn't want to bother with their site who told us, just make the same thing, make the same colors. And we said, we are not doing that. We're not going to recreate something pixel per pixel. Um, often we use the accessibility um, point to convince them not to do their old design. And I think we were pretty successful in not recreating any ugly designs. Plus, none of the designers on the team want to spend their time making ugly. We built in accessibility from the start. So for example, in our Drupal, um, the media upload, you cannot upload an image without entering alternative text. It's actually a required field. So, Folks didn't have to remember to enter it. You actually couldn't even save the file unless you entered the text. And we looked for as many opportunities as we could to build that in. Now, whether the alternative text was good alternative text, now that's up to the content editor, but we at least built that blocker in so, we could, so folks can upload images without it. We tried to standardize as much as possible. So uh, we have a Princeton-specific distribution of Drupal. We call it our template system. It's a multi-site system, and we tried to get as many people into that system as possible for consistency. Um, it, it has, um, I said before, has people content types, news, events, and so forth. And we went out and we sell this system based on its consistency. So there were some customers who thought, well, I want my date above my time, and you know, we said, you know, the 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 cost of doing that would mean we have to build you a custom site and we give them the cost of the custom site and then they would come back and say, no, 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 this, you know, we can go with the date above the time or vice versa. 
um, it also, I think, creates um, a consistent navigation experience throughout the, the, web, the Princeton web. So if, if, let's say I'm a prospective student, I'm considering majoring in, um, I'll just go English compared to history. I can have a more consistent experience comparing the two sites. So I will see um, a list of faculty designed and presented in a certain way with certain fields on one site versus the other site. There's some similarities. However, we did build in options for each department because we knew not everyone here wants to be um, conform to the same template, so they do have the option to turn fields on and off. So we tried to be standard with some um, options for customization, but not too many. Because what I'm thinking about is a few years from now, we're going to have to go from this Drupal 7 distribution to something else. So I'm going to try to build in as much consistency as possible from the get-go, so that a few years from now, we're not finding a surprise hacked code. Um, we also uh, we offer a few design themes in this system, but we did we did build one based off of the main university design. We had through, uh, during this project we had launched a new university website, so of course the old one had to move off the old system too. And the design was one that we aimed to make appealing to as many people as possible. So we built a theme in this multi-site system that leveraged those design elements. Um, so I'll tell you about our progress. Uh, as of today, we've moved 145 websites, so it's about 47% of the way complete. We deleted 60 websites. These were sites that people said, yes, we do want to keep from the beginning, and then as they thought about it, they said, no, we really, we really don't need these sites. Good. Some of the sites are consolidated into one site. So for example, the, the history website, I think they consisted of six or seven websites. We rolled it into one website. I also think it makes for a better navigation experience for the students. So you're not going to this site, then that one, and that one, that one. You can see the whole world of history in one site. And I think we have about 103 websites remaining. So if I could summarize some of the bigger lessons we've learned, when you're migrating a website to Drupal, like any project, build in time for the unexpected. You might also want to think about um, that unstructured content having a cutoff date. So for example, let's say the department did their news all on one big, long, plain HTML page. You might say, look, we're not going to spend the time converting all of that into a news content type, because that requires pasting each line into each field. Um, we did present the option to departments, let's just have a cutoff date, or you know what, let's just leave that old news and those old events, let's just leave them behind. Because if you look at the Google Analytics, nobody is looking at that stuff. Migration scripts only get you so far. So you have to be prepared for some manual cleanup. Um, in Migr, we, um, we have designers, developers, content strategists. Like I said, what we didn't have was folks just handy to, to do um, content cleanup, formatting, making things bulleted lists that should be bulleted lists. So we did reach out to some contractors who could help us do that sorts of work. And I think the departments appreciated it. Um, and also seeking those opportunities to improve. So I, I use the accessibility one as an example, that alternative text being required. That's something we just wanted to build in from the get-go. And that's our project. Questions? Yes. Two, actually. One was, you didn't mention cost as a motivation to change. Did that come up? And then the other question, kind of semi-related to that, would be, did you have to add staff to your department to be able to take care of this? Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, uh, that's a great question. Both of those are, those are great, great questions. So cost. Um, the Roxton system, um, when we did analyze, what, is, what does it take to run the, the Roxton system? Um, we have a yearly support contract with Roxton that um, was, I would say, nominal in, in, you know, in, in terms of an overall IT budget. But really, it was the cost of the staff that we had to have here in IT to run it. So we had um, database administrators, 
We had a few folks who had to run, run the content management system, uh, run the servers, and then my team was building sites on top of it. Uh, and we knew that the, this Roxton knowledge, you know, if any one of these folks at Princeton were to retire or leave, we could not hire people that knew Roxton to come in, they'd have to learn it. Um, so there was the, the, the cost of the, the staff here running it. And that was one of the motivators when we knew we were going to move to Drupal. We said, let's run this in, in a cloud. Um, so cost, um, that, that was mostly around the cost was, you know, let's, let's not pay staff to do this hosting work. We can outsource that because we, there's companies now that do that. We don't need to run it here. Um, and then your second question was around what about, staffing. Do you have to add staff to, to take care of Yes, so we um, pretty much doubled the size of our staff to do this project. Mm -hmm. We were a team of maybe like eight people, and now we're up to 16 people. So we did have to uh, double the size of our staff to get this done. Uh, the way we worked it was we hired a number of term people for the project duration. Oh, yeah. And semi-related to that would be what happens, you, you didn't say what happens in, in 2019 with the people who are the, the very last holdouts. Uh, I, I hope there's none, but I'm, <laughs> I would bet my life that there's gonna be at least two. Yes. At least. Um, I'm not sure what's gonna happen yet. I think that might be more of a decision for our CIO. Um, you know, could, could, we, could we keep running it? Potentially we could. Um, do we want to? Not really. It, I think it just sort of depends. The closer we get to 2019, what's going to happen? Um, I, I had another thought about cost. So, you know, prior to us doing Drupal work and working in our limited content management system, the legacy system, um, more departments were going to outside vendors to get websites done because my team couldn't do those newer modern sites because we were burdened with this older system. So one um, tangent goal to this project was getting more university websites to come into the centralized system to save the university money across the board. Yep. You say you moved to the cloud. Did you go to a platform for hosting, or did you go to a generic cloud like uh, Amazon or Google, Azure? Yeah. So we're hosting in the Acquia cloud. Okay. All of our sites are in the Acquia cloud. We have uh, almost 300 sites there. Did you go Site Factory or ACE? ACE. Yeah. In the back. Yeah. How do you, um, I guess, manage upgrades for all the sites now? Uh huh. <laughs> um, oh, so most, so our template sites, this template system, the standardized system, it's a Drupal multi-site system. Uh, I have at least one developer working on it nearly full time, and we have a monthly release cycle for the system. I sort of think of it as Princeton's Wix, Princeton's specific version of Wix, because you can, you can DIY, you can build your own site in it, um, there's Panoply features, you can drag and drop elements, you don't need my, my team to build a site in it. Um, and because of that, we do get requests every now and then more often than every now and then, <laughs> to improve, change, enhance that system. And so each month we have, a, we have a process whereby we have a planning meeting for the next release. We talk about what we're gonna bundle into the next release, what we think we can fit in. We have about a two week development sprint. We have a one week QA, and then we have a release to production week. So we are continually improving the system on a monthly basis. Do you charge for that? I don't, I don't charge for that. Unless there's a department that wants a feature in there that um, it doesn't exist and they're willing to pay for that feature. And we think it's a feature that can benefit more than one department. So we're not going to put a feature in just for a department, you know, one department. Okay. Up in the back. Can you talk a little bit about your communications plan and how you build that out and what ways you deliver this message mm -hmm. and uh, how long you've been doing that? Yeah, so um, the, the first announcement came out, it, it was an email from our CIO. It, it came out the, the morning, all of IT uh, had a picnic in the afternoon. So it came out and I put my phone down and I, I went to the picnic. 
hoping that I didn't have a lot of panicky people uh, emailing me. Uh, and I did it. So the initial uh, message went out to the university from our CIO. I don't, ex don't remember exactly what population um, got the message. It was definitely anyone on uh, an email list called computing support, so anyone in the computing support realm. And I think it was also sent to all of the um, academic and administrative managers. Um, from there, I then did, uh, I went to talk at any group that would hear me talk. So I went to any IT group, any communication groups, and um, just reminded folks what the project was. Um, so that's, that's been the plan. Talk to anyone I can talk to, as many people as I can, as frequently as I can. Did you have to do presentations to um, any particular leadership? So for instance, you know, like how, how much reporting back to the CIO did you have to do? Did you have to do any reporting to the president? Did you have like deans or chairs that you had to deal with? Uh, I write a quarterly report that goes to my director and the CIO, um, but I have not had to do any uh, report reporting otherwise. They get my quarterly report and and that's it. So, and my my quarterly report includes the amount of sites we've completed, what's left, and also what's remaining um, of this this pool of money that I have to hand out. Yep. So, so the sites that have been migrated, um, how do the stakeholders feel about them? Do they like the admin experience? Do they like the front end experience? How, how the site looks to the public? Um, so far, I think the reaction has been good. They're definitely happier. They have a responsive site. It's fresh. Um, it's a wider width. It's cleaner. There's more space. Um, they like the editing experience. If you could see the old experience, I mean, anything, anything was better. They, they do um, like that they can um, edit pages, and I, I, I tell them, it's like, if you can fill out a form, you can edit a Drupal page. If you can fill in fields and click save or publish, you can edit the page. Um, they like the what you see is what you get editor. I have to say we did a lot of work to get the Drupal 7 editor better than what it is by default. Um, but so far, it's been positive feedback. Um, I sort of set my bar as, you know, if, if any high-level administrator who's really, really busy can edit their Drupal site and say it's easy, then I think that's a, that's a good thing. You don't need the IT or tech skills to edit your site. We also, um, uh, the thing we get a lot of positive feedback on is the fact that people can drag and drop different elements on their page. In our old content management system, it was fixed. If something was in a left column and something was in a right column and you wanted it switched, you had to come back to my development team and we had to make that happen. So. Yeah. And, and, and the prequel to this talk, how, how did you decide on Drupal? Oh wow, that, that's another talk. A um, <laughs> uh, couple factors. One, we were looking, our, our, maybe our bar was low, but we were looking for a content management system that didn't exist in a, in a in a single country where we could only find developers from that single country. Um, so we wanted a system um, that we could, we were able to hire people to work on. Our previous system, nobody knew it. So we wanted, we wanted to be able to hire people to work on the system. The second thing was the open source factor. We really liked that Drupal is open source. And if it doesn't do something that we wanted to do, we can contribute back to the Drupal community and code and and add on and enhance it as we needed to. Yep. Um, now that you're, let's say, most of the way through, any uh, halfway through? <laughs> um, uh, no any, more. Any less, like, what would be your key lesson, like one thing you wish you didn't spend time or effort on that you thought you had to originally? I don't know, that's a good, that's a good question. Um, I think if I, if I had to go back and do it again from the beginning, um, in the beginning I had a form that I sent, out, sent to everyone and I asked them, are you planning to move your site? And I forgot what the response rate was on that. Maybe 40% of website owners responded. 
I think I would have sent that out more aggressively and frequently to get more folks to tell me what they wanted to do with their site. On the flip side, though, um, just by the culture of Princeton, uh, things get done by going and talking to people. People like to talk things out and talk. And so I found that I have to talk through the migration with them for them to come to a decision about they want, what they wanted to do. If presented with just a form, what do you want to do? A lot of, a lot of, many people would just go, I don't know. Mm, yeah. yeah. I can say um, having the ability to offer a solution like archiveit.org to folks made them feel a lot better about not moving their site. I could tell them, look, the content's going to still live on on the web, but you won't be able to edit it, and that's okay because it, it was a one time maybe event that's happened but it'll still live on, and you don't have to go through the work of migrating the site over if you don't have to. Thanks. Okay, okay that's it. I'll, I'll be around if there's any more questions, but thanks for coming. <laughs>